Welcome to October Gallery. And um, we're so delighted that artist Leila Shawa will be giving a talk about her work. Um, she has produced this absolutely extraordinary exhibition and this talk will provide an insight both into her life as an artist and also in detail insight into this work. Um, Leila was born in Gaza. She has lived in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Italy, Austria and um, the United Kingdom. She has um, studied at the um, art college in, Lib uh, in, um, in Egypt, at the, the Rome Academy in Italy, um, where she also had um, tutors such as the Kiriko. Um, in Austria, she um, was taught by uh, Oskar Kokoschka. So she has led a varied life in art and in life. Um, this um, talk will last about 40 minutes, and the last 20 minutes will, the, the 20 minutes after that, will be devoted to talk questions and answers. This was come later, Thank you very much. Just to follow up what um, Elizabeth was saying, I grew up in Gaza. I was born in Gaza. I just want to mention something very quickly about where I was born. I uh, was born in this magnificent Ottoman mansion that was built by my great-grandfather. And it was one of the most beautiful buildings I remember. And it had three levels of gardens around it. Um, I went to boarding school when I was six. I was sent to Egypt to boarding school. And when I was eight, I remember coming home for the summer. And it, the, the big mansion uh, had an annex, which was my great-grandfather's diwan. Diwan was the reception area where he received uh, people who needed help, his friends, and so on. And this other building, was my uh, childhood dream as a place and I wanted it for, for myself and I always told my parents can I have this building for me, I want to live there because it was magnificent. Uh, when I was eight, come home, first thing I usually did was go to see my nanny who was extremely old and run in the opposite direction to that building to just open that very ancient gate covered with wisteria and go in to look at my house. And I tried to open the door and it was locked. And I couldn't understand why it was locked. Suddenly somebody, some noise from the inside happened and somebody unlocked the door, the gate. And I saw a bunch of people standing inside. People I'd never seen in my life. And I said, who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, they said, we are refugees. We've just walked from a town called Dramli in Palestine. And your parents gave us this place to live in. And I thought, how strange my parents should give my place to these foreigners. Anyway, that was the first time I became aware of uh, a change in my country, that there was such a thing as immigrants. And later my parents, of course, explained to me what it was, and I started to understand that there was a war in my country, that another state was declared on what I know as Palestine, and that lots of people lost their homes, they had to flee their towns and cities. Uh, many of them went to the north, to Lebanon, to Jordan. Uh, a great deal of the southern part of Palestine came to Gaza. And uh, so that was the first stage of change in my life. Um, having lived, as uh, Elizabeth said, and I, I was lucky, I, I studied art in Egypt and then in Italy and then in Austria. I've traveled all over the world. I've lived in Lebanon. Um, yes. As I became an artist quite by chance, almost, I uh, went 
went to university in Cairo to study politics. And uh, one day I was having lunch with my father in Cairo. And he had a very close friend who was an Italian Jewish architect uh, having tea with him. And uh, they both said to me, how is university? And I said, I need it. And this gentleman said to me, but why are you, what are you doing? You're studying at university? I said, yes. What are you studying? And I said, I'm studying for, uh, politics, of course, because my family is a political family, and that was the kind of thing you do. And he looked at me and he said, but you, he knew me since I was a child, but you're an artist. Why are you studying politics? And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? And what should I do? He said, study art. And I, I had never, nobody ever suggested this to me. I looked at him and said, art, where do I go for that? He said, well, I teach at an Italian art college in Cairo, and I can have you there tomorrow. I looked at my dad, I said, what do you think? He said, do it. That's what you want to make. Okay. I started studying art. Before a year is out, my teachers at the art college say, we want you to go to Rome. I said, Rome? Yes, Rome. And I thought this is going to create another problem for me with my father and mother. So I said, okay, let me talk to my dad. Talk to my dad. I said, Rome, you know. He said, Rome, what? Scholarship, Academy of Fine Arts. Go, go. Just go. And I found myself on a plane. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life. <laughs> um, Graduated, went back to Gaza, worked for two years in Gaza. Um, had two nervous breakdowns in the process. Um, did a bit of photography with a war photographer who was based in Gaza, worked for the UN. Um, but other than that, my life in Gaza was very unexciting in terms of art. I did, I worked, I painted, but at that stage I didn't really know uh, what my direction is. Um, so I just started looking around me and I, the thing that, that uh, probably gri gripped my, my mind was the dichotomies that existed in a place like Gaza, the social dichotomies. The, uh, the, on the one hand, the total conservatism and on the other hand, the, the tendency towards what we would call westernization. And I, my first exhibition was about that. It was about the contradictions that existed there. Uh, Style-wise, my style was a mixture of Kokoschka, Di Chirico, Montanarini, my, all my teachers, you know, I, I didn't know who I was. Uh, of course, I was influenced by many other artists. Anyway, two years later in Gaza, I decided that I couldn't hack it any longer. And I said to my parents, I, I'm off, I'm going somewhere else. Um, Beirut was the answer, compromise. My mother was Lebanese, so I have a lot of family in Beirut. So I went to Beirut. And I started working in Beirut um, as a painter, full-time painter. My style in those days was, uh, still very influenced by many things, but I uh, started creating my own style. I was very influenced by architecture. Uh, my initial works were very um, architecture-based, um, a bit on the abstract side. Later, I discovered Islamic art, which I knew nothing of before. Uh, in Rome, they didn't mention Islamic art at the academy. Uh, and I discovered that slowly, slowly. Um, that appeared in my work, started appearing in my work. I painted cityscapes, uh, very <laughs> intricate. My work was, had no people in it, or sometimes it did, but they were mar marginalized. I did do a series which focused a little bit on prostitution, very influenced by uh, Egon Schiele in, in my work. But these are different stages. In Beirut, uh, this is very important to, to mention, I, uh, uh, there was
was something called the Union of Palestinian Artists, which was very much controlled by the PLO. And their control was in a manner that if an artist wanted to get anywhere, you had to adhere to a certain style of work. Uh, basically nationalist art or propaganda. And this is something I rejected totally and I had a very strange relationship with the PLO and the Union of Palestinian Artists. Uh, finally, one day, I was asked to join a committee that uh, designed posters, publicity posters, for the PLO. And um, I very reluctantly accepted. The person who rang me to ask me to join was a very famous hijacker called Leila Khaled. I don't know if any of you remember the name. She was imprisoned in Britain after hijacking uh, things. And uh, Leila Khaled and I come from the extreme sides of the divide, socially speaking, and in many ways. However, she rang me and she said, Leila, we need your help. What can I do? She said, we need you to be in this committee that supervises uh, and makes uh, posters for the PLO. I said, fine, okay. So I joined that committee. The committee was made of herself, Leila Khalid, a few other artists, and a member, a poet, um, and a couple of very strange women. One of them in particular was totally out of place. Um, couldn't figure her out, but eventually discovered that she was uh, Yasser Arafat's mistress sitting on this committee. Hmm. I was asked to design a specific poster for an event that took place uh, in 1948. It was a massacre that took place near Jerusalem, uh, where a whole town was wiped out. It was called Deir Yassin, where all the inhabitants were killed, massacred. Um, children, men, women, women had their bellies open when they were <coughs> And all this was documented in photography uh, here and there. And the poster I was supposed to design was to commemorate that massacre. So I worked on this poster for like two months. Uh, my boyfriend at the time was an architect whom I married later, helped me with one thing in that I could not structure a perfect uh, Star of David. But he did it for me. And this Star of David was in very transparent paper that was overlaid on the background, which was the body of a woman outlined in red with inside uh, photographs of children, dead children. It was in black and white with only the red outline. And this very thin, transparent, semi transparent Star of David broke and very evenly on her bed. I gave them, I gave the PLO or that committee my, uh, my poster and I said, you know, that's it. Okay, great, we're going to print it. You can come to the meeting a few, in, in a few weeks. I said, they call me. Or rather, they had me. And she says, uh, oh, can you come to the meeting? Because we're having that poster finally out. I said, great, what time? She said, well. And then she said, Leila, please, uh, can I ask you something? I said, sure, not. Sure. She said, promise me one thing. You're not going to get upset. I said, uh, why would I get upset? She said, because they've, they've changed something in your design. And I said, you changed something in your design. And she said, uh, she mentioned the name of this woman, who was Arafat's mistress. And I, I said, what did she do? She said, well, I don't know, but she said she did something. Can you excuse me for a second?
have remnants of court. Anyway, I go to the piano or whatever, the, the, uh, the place, and uh, I go inside, sit on the table, all the others are sitting there. Uh, where's the poster? No poster. The woman is coming any moment now, so she finally appears. And I, uh, I didn't say anything, I just sat there. And I said, well, where's the poster? Oh, it's coming, it's coming, she said. I said, when? Oh, we, we had to do some, some little changes in it. I looked at her and I said, we? Who? <laughs> Who is we? She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm asking you, you said we. I want to know who we is. <laughs> she said, well, we is me. I said, you. She said, yes. Uh, we thought the Star of David wasn't suitably broken, so I took it off and I broke it more. I said, you did this? She said, yes. I said, can I ask you just something? Exactly who are you? She said, what do you mean, my mother? My name is M somebody, but M means the mother of. This is the title most women carry when they have children. And it's her nom de guerre, in a sense. I said, you, how, how are you qualified to actually touch my work? What do you do? And she said, what do you mean, what do I do? I'm on this committee. I said, yes, but that doesn't qualify you. To touch my work. Of course it does. I said no, it doesn't. Nobody in this room or outside this room or anywhere in the world can touch my work. It's my work. But uh, we have the right. I said no, you don't have the right. But if you think, because you're Arafat's mistress, you can do this, you're very mistaken. How could you tell me this? I said, I'm telling you something that everybody knows. You are a fast mistress, aren't you? <laughs> mm. <laughs> she went totally. I said, listen, let me tell you something. Just to, you know. If I see this poster printed and hung on a <coughs> wall today, I will come here and I will break both your legs. <laughs> 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 she said, what? <laughs> Everybody was sitting there, Leila Khalid, who is the terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, what did you say? I said, you heard me. And if you haven't heard me, I'm telling you all, this woman, expect her to be legless. <laughs> <laughs> and I got up and I said, that's it. I will not work with you people anymore. Thank you very much. And just a moment, what I said. Goodbye. Went. <laughs> Three, four days later, I get a phone call from Leila Khaled. And she says, Leila, oh God, there's a big problem. I said, what, what problem? She said, yes, and her is very upset. I said, really? Why, why is she upset? She said, because of uh, <coughs> something, his mistress. I said, what happened? Why, why is he upset? <coughs> She's in hospital. I said, in hospital? What happened to her? Has she put the poster up and I broke her legs? No. She said, no, but she sent her to hospital. Her blood pressure went up. <laughs> and she almost had a heart attack. And, and so I find this very often as a little that, you know. That was the end of my collaboration on that. Mm -hmm. that one. Now, I said this basically because I wanted to get into uh, what made me become a political artist. At that stage, I was not, I was more interested in developing my work, in developing a personal style, in, in evolving as an artist, and I did not want to get entangled in, in, to, in nationalism, because I do not believe that art that comes from nationalism is necessarily good art. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Um, after that, civil war started in Beirut. Actually, it started on the day the poster was supposed to go up. So it never was seen anywhere in Beirut. Never. I had to leave Beirut suddenly in uh, the end of 75, and 
I spent 12 years not working. I did not do a thing in terms of art. I had become very well known in Beirut because I had created a very successful commercial style, if you like. Uh, my name was very big, but it came all to an end in 75. In 75, I found myself totally lost between where to go. I came to London, I had, my brother came here before me, but then he died suddenly. And I had to take him back home to Gaza. Then my mother died when I got to Gaza. Then my sister-in-law died, so there were three deaths in the family within a very short period of time. I was totally lost. I, I just did not want to teach art. Instead, I got involved in the building of a cultural center in Gaza uh, for my father, who wanted to build this, this big project. That project took about 10, 12 years to finish, basically because the Israelis gave us a lot of difficulties in, in finishing it. In, during that period, of course, I was faced finally with Israeli occupation. Uh, and it, it was very different looking at it when I was living in Beirut, my family was in Gaza, but me going to Gaza and facing it day by day. Every, every day, every morning, every evening, they were there. Um, the years passed, I still didn't do any work. And finally, in 1988, uh, the first uprising, the popular uprising happened in, in Gaza, which spread to the West Bank, which was called the Intifada. And the interesting thing about that was that people suddenly, Gaza, that was a very, uh, I wouldn't say amazingly clean, because you have a very grow, a growing population that's increasing day by day. You have a very bad occupation that doesn't take care of anything. The place started to look shabby and ugly and you name it. But so a new thing happened. You started reading writings on the walls. <coughs> Every time I drive into Gaza I, from, from England, I see more walls covered with writing. And I kept thinking to myself, what is this? And then I realized that people, because the Israelis banned any form of uh, communication in Gaza or in the West Bank for that matter, no radios, no newspapers, no nothing, people resorted to communicating with each other by writing on the walls. And it was not graffiti as is known in the rest, it was actual messages, political messages. And I kept looking at this changing. Every day it was a different writing. <coughs> the Israelis would whitewash the walls to remove these uh, messages of incitement. Uh, but the next morning, the, the walls would be covered with new writing. And I, I kept thinking, OK, what do I do with this? You know, I started thinking as an artist. And then I thought, OK, there's this old camera in the house somewhere that belonged to my father. It was a Rolleiflex, which wasn't a bad camera. And I took it out and I started trying to take pictures with it. It did not work. I found myself another camera. And I started taking photographs of the walls. Um, the more I took photographs, the more I began to understand the company. And the conflict was in that there was clearly a, a resistance movement against occupation, but also there was participation from the Israelis on the walls. So you had this, this layering of, of things. For instance, one day Israelis gave up on actually painting the wall. They devised this new system of, of hosing with tar, massive. U.S. dollar signs on a very long wall in the main street of Gaza. Why dollars? Yeah. So I, I photographed this. I started to go around Gaza. I was pursued by the Israeli army in the alleyways and backways and so on. But I took as many pictures as I could. And in the process, I came across children 
who haunted me, who, who, who went following me everywhere. Initially, they thought I was a foreigner. And uh, they would talk to me first in English, hello, hello, and I say hello. Then they'd say shalom, shalom, and I say no, no, tell me shalom, I don't know. From here. Ah, they finally, finally got to understand that I was not uh, a journalist or an Israeli. I was actually from <coughs> And they would come to me and say, look, you know, you have to take our opportunity. We're not. We're not going to uh, go away for you to take the pictures of the world we want to be photographed. So, okay, so I started taking pictures of children. Uh, I went to refugee camps, I went all over the place. Um, and then I came back here and I started developing these, these images and I didn't know what to do with them at the beginning. I had hundreds of pictures of walls, of writings, of this and that. But suddenly one day I thought, okay, you know, this is my new subject, and it's called Walls of Gaza. And I did a series of, of works, uh, of silk screens of these images, some of these images, which uh, evolved into a second series called the Walls of Gaza too. And uh, one thing that struck me very much in, in Gaza was that Children appear to be very much everywhere, and children appear to be very much targeted by the Israelis. And children in war zones, as you know, are the first victims. They are the ones who suffer, they are the ones who get traumatized. They are the ones who, who carry to the future whatever trauma they have. And so I started working on both the subjects of the wars, the messages, and also of the trauma of children. Because I thought it was very important for people to understand that war, no matter where it is, uh, damages, and it damages the future, and the future is the children. So uh, from there, I think I moved on to other things. Always, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's almost like one is wearing uh, a straight jacket when you're a Palestinian, you can't escape from dealing with the issue of occupation. Um, I've tried to, to get out of it. I went to Malaysia, I was in the rainforest, I was very happy to paint uh, trees. Uh, I, I did lots of things in, in between. But I always go back to the same thing, which is, I don't know if it's an obsession, a compulsion, I don't know what you call it. Well, or maybe it's a commitment. Anyway, uh, I want to talk to you about my last exhibition, which is this one, because I don't want to go on too long. In 2007, I accidentally saw a program on television called The Cult of the Suicide Bomber. And there was a very small section in it that showed footage of a woman suicide bomber crossing the border between Gaza and Israel. And she is caught on camera obviously suspected of carrying something, so she's asked to take off her clothes, which she does, you will see the video there, um, which she does, and uh, she tries to pull something out of her pocket, which appears to be a, an explosive device, and she pulls it out, and it falls on the floor. She picks it up, puts it back in her pocket, she pulls it out again, by then, my uh, brain was saying, why, why is she doing this? You know, a, a device, if it falls, that must have lost the connection, no matter what she does, she's not going to do anything with it. She tries two, three times to put it back in her pocket and to detonate it. It doesn't go on. And, uh, I mean, and then it finishes uh, with her. Uh, I, I found out later that she was arrested and she's in jail in Israel. What intrigued me was her failure uh, to detonate herself. I thought to myself, okay, if I were um, a suicide bomber, I'm given a device, I'm asked to go and blow myself up, a piece, I would learn it properly. Why didn't she? And something else came to my mind, maybe because she's a woman and she is dispensable, perhaps. <coughs> 
I rank the producer <coughs> of, the, of the documentary. And uh, I met with him and I asked him if I could buy the rights to the video, which I did. And then I sat on this documentary for three years. I didn't know what to do with it. How do I project this? What is it that I'm trying to say? I started to research women's suicide bombers. Started to find out why they do what they do. Um, to my great surprise, maybe not surprise, but I really was shocked to discover that a massive number of these women, I mean the majority of them, let's say, because there were not that many, but a good number of them were women who had either uh, clashed with their own families, had issues, social issues with their families, may have been considered unacceptable in their behavior within a very conservative society. Uh, some of them, their marriages failed and they were facing divorce, which was also not acceptable to their families. The sum of it is that they were encouraged to become suicide bombers, to Uh, restore the honor of the family. Now, that does not mean, and I'm not uh, ignoring the other factors, is that we are under occupation, a very bad, a very, a very uh, brutal occupation. Some of these girls' families may have been killed in, by the Israelis. We are being raided every day, every day, every day. Uh, by different modes of killing by the Israelis. And so I cannot separate the two things totally. I'm a Palestinian, I'm for resistance, but I do not agree with suicide bombing. It is totally against anything I believe in. Also, if, uh, if people mistakenly think that Islam encourages uh, suicide killing uh, or killing of self. This is a huge, huge uh, misconception because Islam bans, prohibits firstly the killing of self or the killing of others. It is completely banned. As in Christianity, as in all the divine religions, thou shalt not kill, and that includes you. You don't kill yourself, and you certainly don't kill the others. So, what what exactly happened here? You know, uh, why why is this happening? Is it misinterpretation of Islam? Is it is it misdirection by whoever is interested in directing these these things to happen? Uh, I found that okay, suicide bombing may give satisfaction for five minutes to someone saying, ah, we have taken revenge and we've killed so many of the enemy. But the repercussions of that killing is so much bigger on, on the, the people who supposedly uh, produce the suicide bomb. That is it's not, it doesn't work. It's, it's terrible. And it's, it's actually inviting more damage to a situation which is, which is hopeless in the first place. So anyway, I decided to um, present this, uh, in my mind, a dilemma. Um, I'm not passing judgment. I'm not saying suicide bombers are. Uh, I, I disagree, as I said, with suicide bombing. But I cannot judge the women totally and say they were bad. Are they martyrs? Are they heroes? Are they freedom fighters? It's up to you. I mean, I pose questions. But uh, I'm posing the questions within the context of aggression. You have a country which is in Gaza, was bombed in 2008 9, was it? Uh, uh, Operation Castellet, drones. Uh, 1,500 people died in, in a couple of weeks. White phosphorus was used. Children are still dying today from white phosphorus that was thrown in Gaza 
just two years ago, three years ago. They are still dying today. So where do you go, you know? I mean, how, how do you manage this? Um, as an artist, all you can do is try to present uh, a section of that. Um, and, and let people decide, you know, let you guys decide, you, the audience. It, does it make sense to you? Is this right? Is it wrong? I have no answers. All I can do is uh, give my um, reaction. And my reaction is at many different levels. I burnt dolls. And I almost burned my friend's house in the process. <laughs> so that I would photograph dolls rather than use the pictures of children, their children. And some of them are here, some of the, the dolls you can see in the... And um, the writing that you see on this uh, diptych is actually not real Arabic. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of Greeking. It's, 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 the lettering is Arabic, it's all connected to language, but it doesn't mean anything. And it is about how we can misread or misinterpret what we are being told. Or sometimes we are being told the wrong message. And we act upon it, uh, which, is, uh, which leads to severe consequences after that. Did I reach the 40 minutes? I think you did. Thank you. I don't know if this makes sense. I just wanted to, to, to say 40 minutes of to, to say one thing. 40 minutes of the On the oh, top. On the top. <laughs> Mannequins, these five mannequins. This was the fun part because I asked two friends of mine to design suicide belts. Uh, one of them, who is a Lebanese jeweler and photographer, uh, made this one. And this reads uh, Pride, Freedom, Land, Hope. That's her point of view. The other friend, who is an English designer, designed that. Belt, which says, release me if you dare. The body of the girl is, is covered with the same writing which appears here. That belt is totally mine and it's in direct reference to honor killing. The grenade that she's carrying between her legs is an Israeli grenade actually. But it is, it is a reference to the, the killing of, you know, the substituting honor killing with suicide bombing. The one over there was very difficult to make because I wanted to use these rhinestones and I couldn't find rhinestones this size. So I rang my sister in law in Dubai and I said, listen, go to the Chinese dragon mall, which is the biggest uh, mall outside China <coughs> you can find it in Dubai, outside Dubai, and find me some rhinestones. So she goes and she finds me uh, hair <coughs> grips with stones on them. And she calls me and she says, Ella, I only if I could find these hair grips. I said, fine, buy them, 720 hair grips. Yeah. I, it, it took me about <laughs> 10 days, made a hole in my hand to remove the stones from the, from the actual hair grips. And this was the result. Uh, the, this one is with the, the peacock feathers, I was on the bus and I, there was this little Indian man sitting in front of me carrying loads of feathers. And I tried to talk to him and finally we agreed that I could buy from him this bunch of feathers for whatever. <coughs> and I kept them, I didn't know what to do with them. And uh, then I had the idea of creating this bird of paradise. Then I found the most amazing Dolce Gabbana belt in a charity shop in Oxford. And my friend Sybil bought it. For me, I was carrying money. She said, I'll buy it. She bought it. And I used it in this. The rest is plastic from Amazon. I mean, the, the rest is all made up by me. So I just wanted to tell you about all these, these different things. That's it. Thank you.